Our next talk is going to be enabling incremental adoption of NixOS with module contracts. Let's welcome Pierre. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. And so, yes, um, I'll be talking about incremental adoption of NixOS and what we need to do to be able to enable that. So a little bit about me before. Um, I'm Ebit Zaman on internet, if you saw me there. Pierre Pennings. I'm really, really into self-hosting and into data sovereignty. And that's the angle I approach NixOS and everything I do. And that's also what I want to enable more with this talk and what I propose in this talk. Um, a little bit about work. I worked uh, until very recently at Fastly. For those that know, they're the CDN for the Nix packages binary cache. So that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but then I moved uh, to Switzerland recently, and I'm now a, a full stack engineer at, at WeDo. Um, and for the funny part of all this, I moved from Belgium to LA for uh, the work, and then Nine years later and six kids later, I'm back in Switzerland now. So I moved like literally a month ago. <laughs> and now I'm here to present to you. But anyway, that, that was about me. So um, this talk, I'd like to essentially introduce a new pattern into Next packages and convince you that it's a good idea and that you should all do that for those that uh, maintain something in Next packages. And it's actually an old pattern. And you'll see what I mean about that, but it's not rocket science, I didn't invent anything, it's like something that we just don't use and that I find fitting. And so the promise about this pattern is that it will improve our capability to share code across modules, that it will improve code quality, and that finally it will um, enable increment, incremental adoption by other people that do not use NixOS right now. So um, just so you know the structure of the talk, I'll just go over a little personal history of how I used NixOS and how I got introduced. Uh, the issue I saw with NixOS at the stand now, I'll introduce a new pattern and then I'll show you what the, essentially the world with this new pattern would look like. Um, so um, I started, as maybe some of you, with a, a new server at home a long time ago now, and it was my old desktop server, uh, very simply. Um, so it got XBMC at the time, for those that know. It was to see movies. That's the, it was a shiny app, you know, that I could show to fam my family, so that's the reason why <laughs> I installed that one. Uh, but then I didn't know anything about managing software and things like that, so the way I did that was very imperatively, right? So I installed a few things, you know, and it piled up, it piled up, uh, and then <laughs> the list went on forever, right, of things I wanted to try. But then at some point, everything was imperative, so when I got to... Uh, the last thing, you know, the dashboard, I found a Homer package that does this, that has a nice dashboard for your web UI. Well, I needed to change everything I did previously, and I forgot everything about everything, of course. So this has the unmanageable stamp, and I didn't really like the solution, but that's what I had. You know, it accumulated over the years. So um, <laughs> I tried something else. Um, I was using Emacs at the time, Vim also actually, so there's no, no war there, I used both. Um, and I did this. So essentially in Emacs, I don't know if you know, there's a org mode package, um, which essentially is a way to do kind of declarative um, literacy um, inside Emacs. And I had this documented uh, checklist of things I needed to do to install something. Which kind of worked, uh, actually, uh, surprisingly, now that I see this a uh, long time afterwards. But so, you know, I had something to install a package um, using Arch Linux at the time. I had something to create a Postgres uh, database, which is not really unlike what we have on NixOS, actually. Um, I have something to create to manage a file for the reverse proxy. And then I got to the point where I, need, I wanted to have SSO. Don't ask me why, but I found that cool. And so I was like, let's configure SSO for everything. But that was too much for this standalone file. So I had even scripts I created in Bash. And it was, again, quite uh, horrible. <laughs> so if this is literally screenshots from the file I used uh, before switching to NixOS. And you can see these are all the up levels, top level, you know, things I needed to manage. And in 
um, nested inside was like a long list of things I needed to do. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of copy pasting. And again, it was unmanageable. But then I discovered NixOS, and it was super cool. And by the way, the way I discovered NixOS was using through Haskell and Reflex FRP, which is a um, functional reactive programming package for Haskell. And that thing is so complicated that it needed to use Nix <laughs> to build. And so I, when I first stumbled into that, I was like, oh no, something new to learn. But then for a year or so, I kept it on the side and finally realized what it could do. And so I wanted to use that. Um, so on the laptop, it was quite easy to start using that because in a way, my laptop is just a few files I have laying around, a few documents, uh, code editors, but that's about it. There's not too much state, right? So I could start anew pretty much easily. But then the question is, how would I move my server to using NixOS? Like, if you remember that long list of things I installed, there was no way I could convert that to NixOS in, a, in an afternoon, right? So the question is this. How do I switch the server from this thing to NixOS? And so the first option that I do not recommend is a clean state, right? So what happened to my server at some point was it fried. So that made an easy path for me to start from scratch because everything was down anyway and reconstructing the other one was too painful. So that was easy. I could upgrade to uh, some crazy beast of uh, hardware. Um, shout out to the self-hosted postcat actually because I got it me for uh, half the price. So that was nice. And it even has four USB 3.0. Uh, ports, which was a huge improvement for me. So that's, that gives you the level of where I was at that time. Um, and so, clean state, right? I could do this, services.nextcloud.email enable equal true. And this thing sets up a lot of things for me. Everything I, I took like months to get right, I could do in one line of code in NixOS. So it sets up Nginx, the reverse proxy, PHP, FPM, uh, it even allows you to choose between multiple databases. Um, and same thing for the cache. You could choose Postgres or MySQL or Redis or MCached, and I think there's even more now. So I really was convinced I needed to use this for NixOS, and that's how I started. Um, but then this is the happy path of using NixOS, at least how I see it now, starting from scratch. So. First option for people to adopt NixOS is do the same thing as me, just fry your server and then switch over. But we all know that's not really realistic, uh, especially in enterprise environments. So how, so essentially what would happen if I, my server did not fry at the time, right? What if everything ha um, was working perfectly? How could I switch over my server? And the question could be more precise is how to make people try out just a little part of NixOS in their current infrastructure. And so, in a, another way, is like this services.nextcloud.enable legal true. How could I make it work with uh, everything I had already um, working at the time? So, this is the first thing I want to show you, incremental adoption. And the question, of course, with this one is how can I use my reverse proxy? How can I use my database that I set up like a long time ago? How can I use my cache? And this is really not possible right now um, in Next packages in general. I'm, by the way, I'm picking on the Next Cloud module just because I like it. It's not because I, I hate it. It's the, pretty much the opposite. So I want to make this better, uh, easier to use, but in, in a way, it does too much. You know. So um, yes, what about other reverse proxies? And something that's really I don't see talked about too much is how can I even link this to another host? Because if you think about like how um, you would incrementally adopt NextCloud in your existing infrastructure. Well, you could start a VM with NixOS, but you could also have another machine. But in a way, you need to link the two environments together, right? And there's no real way to do that out of the box um, with NixOS. Um, there's another side quest, which is how to have multiple instances of a DB, of a reverse proxy. So this is a very interesting question, but this is not about this. Uh, multiple instances, just so you know. Um, but that's interesting too. Um, so the second promise is about improving code quality. And so what we have now is a giant beast of module that does a lot of things. So everything I talked about, like it sets up Nginx, allows you to choose between Postgres and MySQL and things like that. 
it's all inside that module, embedded inside that module. And the thing is, I see as an issue, is that essentially the next level module tries to own all these dependencies. And, um, well, spoiler a little bit, but that's to me what needs to change. Um, and also a side problem of this is that if you want to be able to tweak the setting of Postgres, for example, that's Nextcloud setups, then in a way Nextcloud needs to expose all these options um, because it owns Postgres, so it needs to expose those, or you need, of course, to, I mean, you can always read the source code, right? That's easy. Um, but that's what needs to change. You need to read the manual or the source code, and that's not really a great experience. Um, another way to put this is sp uh, splitting the, um, the knowledge into multiple groups, right? For now, the next group, the next cloud, sorry, maintainer needs to know a lot of stuff about a lot of things, and that's not really tractable and maintainable ab across like all the packages. And um, I see, and I suppose you see too, like different level of adoptions of different technologies across different services that are provided through modules uh, in Next packages. And again, that's something I would like to show you that it's possible to change. And the final one, sharing code. So Nextcloud does a lot of things, but it doesn't really allow you to set up declaratively backups, um, LDAP support, SSO. You can do it, um, but it's hard. And again, other services do it, but you cannot really benefit from it um, apart from copy-pasting code around, I guess. Um, and yes, that's what we're doing most of the time. And that's, to me, what uh, I'd like to see change also. So about owning dependencies, this is how I see the next cloud module right now. There's a core in the middle, and then it does a lot of things. <laughs> um, the goal for me would be to move that out of the next cloud module, OK? Um, so I talked a lot about problems. So I'd like to show what the solution is, and it's in a sentence, very easy, but we'll see, I'll show you ex exactly all that entails afterwards, is like not owning the dependencies. Nextcloud shouldn't be the one that sets up the database. You should give the database to Nextcloud, in a way. Oh, sorry. And so how I called this, and I'm not good at naming things, so um, I call this contracts, this separation, and I'll show you just now what I mean. So the goal, right, after this would be to have the core of Nextcloud take most of the module of Nextcloud in terms of, I guess, line of code, um, if, you can, if that's a good measure. And so, for example, you need a reverse proxy. So the Nextcloud module will say, hey, I need a reverse proxy, right? And something else would provide that Nginx um, reverse proxy to Nextcloud. So you could do the same for PHP. To be honest, I don't know much the various implementations of PHP FPM, but it's still an example, but then you have the cache. You know, you could have a, a Nextcloud say, hey, I need a cache, and then you could give the cache to Redis, and same for the database, okay? So that's the goal of uh, what I want to show you. And just so we're okay with a, we have the same nomenclature. Again, I'm not good at naming things, but I called, ex the next cloud side, the requester, because it requests something. And then on the, on the right side, you have the providers, which provide the thing that next cloud requests. And the promise with this also is, I think you can see it already, is that, yeah, right now, Nginx is hard coded inside next cloud, but with a pattern like this, somebody else could write a caddy module that interfaces with this reverse proxy contract, and nothing in next cloud needs to change for you to be able to switch reverse proxy. And same thing for the rest, right? So what does a contract look like? Well, it's um, in Nick's uh, terminology, it's a set of options, like module options, and unexpected behavior. We don't really have something like that, like a behavior in Nick's package right now, but if you think about how you would interface this with uh, existing providers, uh, modules that provide this uh, reverse proxy contract, well, we would need something like a, a little adapter that essentially um, implements the options of this reverse proxy contract and would tailor the Nginx um, existing module that has you know, different names for options and things like that 
to respect the behavior that the contract is expecting. And same for each of them. Maybe at some point, the adapters would merge or something, but this is, provides at least a, a not intrusive way to add this thing to next packages. And so, yeah, just to, to be clear, this would be a module on top of the module that we have already that would configure uh, the providers. So uh, one question about how would you even enforce this, the fact that the Nginx, for example, um, reverse proxy um, behaves the way you expect it. Uh, little spoiler, I'll show you afterward, but the idea is with NixOS tests and to have an um, abstract NixOS test at the level of this reverse proxy contract. And so uh, about the three promises I talked about in the beginning, like the first one was sharing code. Um, how does that look like in this uh, world with contracts? Well, you could just have other services like Home Assistant, Jellyfin, whatsoever, point to the same reverse proxy, and they would automatically share the code um, that the Nginx maintainers would have made, or uh, all the others. And if at some point another reverse proxy gets added, uh, it gets added to all of those that uses this contract automatically. Um, about code quality, um, for me, there's this separation of concern is really important. It means that the Nextcloud maintainer knows Nextcloud can focus on making Nextcloud good and, and behave in, uh, in, uh, in the NixOS in, uh, environment and ecosystem. And same on the other side, you would have the maintainer of Nginx that knows Nginx that can do what needs to be done, you know, and that to, to interface with um, NixOS in a great way. And you don't need to cross necessarily the boundary. So in our case, it's more like um, people interested, right? That would be maintainers. But the idea is that you could split this in a way. In the middle, you'll have you'll need to agree on something, of course. So the community would need um, to enforce this reverse proxy contract, or at least came, come up with you know, a standard set of options and behaviors that this reverse proxy contract uh, would need to do and would need to implement. Um, but I'm not an expert in reverse proxy, so that's the goal also. You know, it's like uh, being able to crowdsource this expertise in a better way than what we have now. And not really related to code quality, but something that for self-hosting is like super important. It means that when you're building your box, you're the one in charge of selecting which reverse proxy goes with Nextcloud, right? Or whatever service. You're the one picking the provider that the requester service uh, asked for. And that's super powerful to me as a self-hosting enthusiast. And so just to um, insist on that, the, the idea would be to, to for um, a provider to prove that it can uh, respect this contract, you would have NixOS test to do that. And I'll show you in code later on what that looks like. Okay, and finally, the, the last promise about incremental adoption. So the idea is to merge the gap between essentially the NixOS world and the non-NixOS world, whatever that word is. Um, and so what do you put here, right? This little box. So the idea would have to, to be that the end user provides um, a provider to this reverse proxy contract, but in the config of this implementation, there would be nothing. It would, like that, it would not work, but the idea is that on this external world, anyway, the goal is not for NixOS to manage it. It's all manual, it's Ansible, it's Terraform whatsoever. And so the idea is just to say to NixOS, hey, don't worry, I'll take care of this. Just do the evaluation and deploy and I'll take care of setting up what needs to be done manually inside this other server or whatsoever. And this is how you could bridge the gap between um, your NixOS box or VM and what you had before if you want to, to transition or try out uh, NixOS. So as an um, example of how we do things now and how things could look like with this, um, <laughs> I propose you to go through a little example of um, creating a Forge, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it actually, Forge Joe service, um, and link that to uh, Otelia to have a SSO um, enabled Forge Joe instance, okay? And 
uh, just because I know SOPs and um, that's the one I'm using, I'll use SOPs as an example for uh, the secrets in between. Um, so I put those on the top right here so we can follow exactly which point of view we're looking at when we look at the code. So the first thing is Otelia. Um, there's a, just so you know, this, um, it's a bit long on the slides. So O.S is for options.services and C.S is for config.services. So that's what I'll use for the rest of the presentation. But so there's an option in um, Otelia, if you don't know, uh, to create an OIDC client. And that's essentially a list of submodules um, in uh, Nix module terms. And for us, uh, I'll reduce the, the plethora of options to just a few so we can follow. But the idea is you have a client ID, which is a string. You have a client secret, which is a secret that shouldn't be stored in the next store, uh, right? Which is a, um, it's a string because it's the path to a file inside uh, NixOS when it gets deployed. And redirect URIs, uh, which is something that doesn't really interest anyone, but you still need to configure to get this set up right, okay? On the Forge Joe side, you have this options, uh, which is you need to also to provide the client ID, which is a unique string, but needs to match between Othelia and uh, Forge Joe. And you have the client secret, which again, same thing is a secret and needs to match between both, okay? Finally, the end user, what would we need to do to uh, bridge the gap between both? You will need to say, hey, the client ID is Forge Joe, again, it's a unique string, you can choose whatever you want, it just needs to match. And we'll see in a bit how the client secret is done. And then on the Othelia side, you would get, uh, you could just you know, copy paste the string, but uh, let's say you want this a bit more manageable, and so you'll reuse the same options that you set up uh, at the top, right, for the client ID and the secret. And then you need to set up the redirect URIs, which is this thing, uh, with the FQDN, the fully fied fully qualified domain name um, related to your domain where you host things. Uh, but you need to put this in, which is no fun, right? Um, so how do you know, again, what to put in there? You need to read the manual, and um, it doesn't exist, so you need to read the source code. You need to understand how Otilia works, how Forjo works, etc., etc. So another um, layer on top of this a little bit, which is what usually we have in the services right now, uh, in the module services in Next packages, is Forge Joe will configure for you the Otelia part, okay? And this is, um, yes, what Forge Joe would do. So here, the user wouldn't need to set up the client ID, it's like there's a default, so you don't need to figure that out. You still need to set up the client secrets. And then on, in the same, service file, right, in the same module, there would be the configuration part of Forge Joe, which would set up Otilia and would add its own o OIDC client because in a way Forge Joe knows what, it's need, what it needs to have from Otilia to work correctly. And again, this time it means that the maintainer of Forge Joe would um, set up the redirect URIs for you. The end user wouldn't need to know about this, which is good. Um, but then that means that we get in the same issue we had before with the next cloud module is that you need then to provide an option for the user to pick which provider of SSO it, they want. And then if there's a new one that comes up, the Forge Joe maintainer needs to add it to the options, et cetera, et cetera. But th so this is what we have and it works pretty well still, um, or enough, I'd say. And so on the end user side, um, when they set up the SSO uh, in Forge Joe, so um, they would give the provider, right? It's Otilia in this case. Um, assuming, you know, there's a default set to null and if, it's, if you don't give it, there's no SSO configured. Um, on the client secret side, you would then give the secret, uh, which in SOPS terminology is uh, created this way. You have a SOPS.secrets. whatever string you want, which is a unique identifier for uh, the module. And then you need to give the mode, the owner, the restart units in there, um, which we don't know where to find, and there's nothing telling us how to do that again, so it's again back to reading the manual and actually reading the source code again for this to set it up, right? So we did that. Let's say we did that, we took the time, and so, oh, now we know it's uh, this mode, it's this owner, this 
service that we need to restart when the secret restarts, when the secret changes, which to be honest, maybe we could have guessed, um, but still it's annoying to do ourselves. And then, yes, we could be a bit more smart again, instead of copying again the, the Forger owner, we could use the one that is provided by the service so that when you, when you change it, if you change it, it gets automatically updated, but it's still annoying to do this part. Um, so let's say you do that, you deploy, and then you get an error because um, otelia-yourdomain.com.service cannot start because it cannot read the secret file. And so why is that even happening? Well, if we go back to how we, um, how the Forjo um, module was set up, we had an option at the top for the secret, and then we shared that secret with the Otelia um, OIDC client instance, but those are two different services that run with two different usernames, I mean Linux users, and so of, of course the Otelia one cannot read um, the one from Forjo. So the way I saw that at the time was instead of having the, the mode B0400, for those that, that, that means something, I created a new group for the both to share and then that was another pain um, to do, I mean, very manual stuff to do for um, no fun, essentially. Um, so in a way we would want to do, hey, get that client secret, but change the owner to Otilia, which doesn't work, of course, because the client secret is a path to a file and not the path to the module and we cannot really clone that thing around, so this doesn't really work, but this is what we still want, would want to do, right? So, um, yes, it's because it's a string. Um, so, the other option is to have a second option to have the end user fill out the secret for Otilia, and we call it client secret for Otilia, and then in the documentation, you need to say, hey, this is for Otilia, so don't use the same user as for Joe, and then this would work. Um, uh, yes, so this would work, sorry. Um, and then if you look at what we had before, we had um, this configuration for the client secret for Forge Joe, but we added a new one, you know, for Otelia. And so what do we need to put in there? Guess what? We need to read the manual or read the source code to know, right? So after reading source code, you know that you need to put in this, which to be fair is harder to guess because uh, the um, otelia-domain.service is not like super obvious, or at least I wouldn't have guessed that at first. So you need to understand how that module is set up in the source code, it's not like super obvious. So, oh, sorry. Um, these are the two secrets the end user needs to, to create by hand and needs to read the manual for, we need to, need to read the source code for. So essentially this is how it looks like in a, um, comics form, I guess. Um, so there's Forjo that asks you, hey, I need a little secret. Then user says, okay, sure, I'll ask Subs. Uh, Subs says, hey, yes, I can provide you a secret, but I need all these options set up, please. And so the end user says, okay, sure, I'll ask Forjo. Forjo answers very gently and saying, oh yeah, just read the manual for all the options I need and then read the source code, the end users will do that. A little bit later, that's the most annoying part, reading the source code, it's um, the longest time, right? Finally, the end user knows, oh yes, this is all the options I need to set up for SOPS, it asks SOPS about the secrets. SOPS will say, hey, sure, I'll give it to you at this path. And then finally, the end user can say, hey, for Joe, this is the path you need to look for for the secret you asked for. So I hope you, arrive to the same conclusion as me, this is kind of annoying. Um, and to be fair, also not a great user experience, especially for those that just want to try out NixOS. Um, so let's see what this picture looks like with the contracts. So let's squeeze a little bit of contracts in between all those uh, actors. And again, just so we're on the same, uh, using the same nomenclature, there's the provider that provides um, the secrets in this case, and the requester, which is Forjo, that needs the secrets. I put those again at the little at the top right here, so that we can see which point of view we're looking at. So first, finally, <laughs> I guess uh, we'll look at in code what lo what a contract looks like. 
So it's essentially a submodule that has two parts, the request part and the result part. And by the way, this is like a totally up to change. So this is like what I did in my garage, right? So um, that's also the reason of this talk is to show you this and get opinions about this. Uh, so don't take this as this must be the way to write contracts, okay? Uh, but then in the, at some point we need the options we saw earlier, the mode, the owner, restart units. Um, there's even more actually for uh, the secrets, but it doesn't fit in the slide. And then we need this free form type equals anything um, for those that know, but I'll show you afterwards why we need that. So this is the requester part, right, of the contract. And then at the bottom we have the result, which is again a submodule. And in this case we have the path where the secret will live, and this is the provider part. So um, let's see how SOPs can use this. Um, so we have the requester part, again these options that SOPs were already providing. We have the path part, which is the result, um, and then for SOPs, you need to configure actually more than just these. You need to give it, well, the file where the, the, um, the secret is encrypted. So this is an extra option, you know, to configure this provider. And it will change for every provider. And this is why we need the freeform type equals anything. Um, just so you see why, why I put that in there. Um, and by the way, I was talking before about like adapters for different things. But in this case, I cheated and I adapted the contract to match subs <laughs> because I could, um, because I'm the only one using that for now. But obviously there would be some adapter in there that, but if I showed that I would take hours to show everything. But anyway, so now that we have um, this contract, how does Forjo use this? So it's in, in a way quite simple. You would have this SSO client secret. Actually, do you see my pointer? Perfect. Um, you have this SSO client secret at the top, and you would say create an option, and the type is of contracts.secret.type, okay, what we defined just before. Um, in a way, I would like here to say yes, and what I need is this mode, this owner, and this restart units options, but that's not really possible because the type here is um, the result of make option, you know, MK option, which is not like directly translatable, so we need to go back to the contract and change that a little bit to make this a, a function, essentially, that takes all the defaults and that passes that around there. Maybe there's another way to do this, but that's the way I found and the most easiest. Um, so if we come back to the forger side, this is then finally how we would create the requester side of this secret contract for Forge Joe, um, which Okay, I, I did it, so maybe I'm, I'm totally biased, but it's not like too bad. <laughs> um, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Uh, so that is for the Forjo part, and let's see how all these pieces fall together for the end user. Um, what would be super? Oh yes, what would be super cool is if we could say, hey, take this SOPs things, and then do whatever you want with that. So you you manage it how you want. So I didn't manage to do that. I got a lot of infinite recursion when I tried that. So the way I propose right currently is more uh, convoluted, and there's more. Uh, it's more convoluted, but it's not too too bad. Uh, but we can definitely work to to make this better. So the way it works now in code is to have this Forjo SSO client secret, and you give it the request from Forjo. Okay. And then you need to add the provider specific options, the extra options from before, which is the subs file where you have the secrets. So this is what fulfilling the requester part looks like from the end user perspective, okay? And then you need to tie that back up because now, okay, you told subs how to create the, the secret, but then you need to say to forge Joe where to find it. And so you need to do actually the opposite, say to Forjo, hey, the result will be found here, okay? So, and also the, we could be more consistent with like the suffix here of all the options, but uh, again, that's what I have for now. Um, but this does not work, again, because infinite recursion and I couldn't make it work that way, so you need to be a bit more specific and give the path uh, actually explicitly. 
Again, maybe there's a way around this. Um, and so, with the contracts, this is how our little comic looks like now. Um, Forge your ask for a secret, and you say, hey, you sure, just talk with subs. And that's about it. Um, and that's a much better story for uh, the end user, I think. So, uh, maybe some of you spotted like this new pattern is like totally not new, actually. And it has other names in literature. And again, I'm not like a theorician. So I could be wrong here, but that's what I found from Wikipedia, in a way. So it's essentially dependency inversion, uh, just applied to next packages. It has also a mix of interface um, that's not really talked upon in dependency inversion specifically. So the interface is like the contract itself and how we, we define that. And Funnily, I, it's not actually totally related to design by contract, which is totally different. <laughs> uh, I didn't expect that when I named that contract, actually. And it's also not related to inversion of control. Just if you know about those, uh, it's not related. It's a little bit related to plugins. You could think about that way, too. Um, so um, if we come back to the promises from earlier, how does this fulfill the promises I talked about? So about sharing the code. Um, the, um, you could see that you could add a provider quite easily, right? And so in code, what does that mean? Oh, sorry, I'm just checking how am I on time. Um, what does that mean is that you would, from the end user perspective, you would switch from this to this, right? The glue code stays the same, but you would just switch the provider and you would give a different extra option to, for the, that particular provider. Uh, on the requester side, how would you add a new one? Well, from the end user perspective, you would have this Forge Joe one, and then you would switch to Otilia. Again, it doesn't change much. You just change which provider you give. Um, then, about the testing I talked about, um, well, the cool thing is you could have more evolved testers for what you do. We could have a hard-coded secret for tests, that is essentially what we do with write test, uh, sorry, write text, but it's um, evolved in the sense that it understands the contracts and behaves the way the contract is doing. And so, for example, for uh, the hard coded secret here, uh, you would get. Um, I'm not going to go too much into details, but essentially, you would have the write text that we have usually, but then you would uh, put that in a program that would create a path with the correct. Uh, mod, mode, sorry, and the correct user and owner, and then you will copy over that. And so what you give back to the user is a file that has the correct, um, correct uh, owner and mode. And so for the test, it's much better than write text because it actually showed me a few bugs I had in code where um, that was not respected, essentially. And on the other side, so yes, so you, again, from the end user perspective, if you want to test your code with the new hardcode stuff we just wrote, you just need to change, again, the provider. It doesn't change like the glue code, just changes the extra options you give, which here it would be the hardcoded content. Um, on the other side, you could test the providers themselves, which is a big piece of the promise here. And so you would have a common NixOS test for um, which would be abstracted above all this. Um, so I'm sorry, I'll just ask, do, how, many, how much time do I still have? One minute? OK. <laughs> so I'll rush over this then, um, and I can show you maybe if you have questions. Um, same thing, we can solve the incremental adoption. All right? And again, we can write a module. I, I'll share the code afterwards so you can see what it looks like. But like I was saying, the config is empty because the promise is we'll do it by hand ourselves. OK? Um, so on the benefits for me of introducing this pattern, we can finally share code between all the services. We can improve the code quality by adding tests that are more meaningful and that are abstract also. And the same test for all the packages providing the same contract. And it would allow incremental adoption in next packages because someone can provide their own uh, implementation on, of one of the contracts that suits them. Um, my project on this is called self Blocks. I, I have a few services, a few contracts, um, 
all these at the bottom are not yet implemented. Oops, sorry. And um, on the right are the services I implement. So I'm trying to merge all this together to get a picture of what this could look like and something that actually works. Um, so that's uh, yeah the project you can find. You can use the QR code if you dare. Um, I know it's a bit scary. Uh, and then I'll switch to the end and just finish on this. Yes, so about the future of this, on my side, I'll anyway continue on, on this project because I use it for my server. I'll add more docs, services, contracts, and everything. And I'm also upstreaming a few things. I mean, it's slow, but I'm still doing it. Um, about, but I also, I don't really know how what the best way would do to introduce this inside Nix packages. Uh, RFC seems... a uh, even small compared to all this, but it's a good start. But, and I love some help on how to structure this. Um, I upstream already something in the PR about secrets, uh, so you can check that out. I tried to have a grant from NLNet. I would recommend all of you to try that also. I don't know if I have it yet, we'll see. And then these are the links to all my stuff. Um, so yeah, thank you for... Uh, attending my talk, and uh, if you have, I don't know if you have time for questions, but a, a few, <laughs> if anyone has. Okay, we got a question over there. Try and keep it short, also the answer as well. <laughs> so in interest of time, I could be short. Um, <laughs> you had a graph with 4 calling out the implementations through the contract to create the things in need. Yep. What I would more prefer if is there was a layered architecture where you have the base module and then modules on top which merge in the options and then do that through the R. Um, I think that's slightly more composable, I'm not sure. Um, the other thing is, I don't know if Addis Bodies is here, but they were talking to me about like um, input output thing which isn't a recursive fixed point. Uh, and that sounds exactly what you're doing, where you have a, let's call it a module, which has an input-output. Mm -hmm. You define what the schema on the input, where you're calling the output into, what other interface, and that works. Yes. So find them, talk to them. Oh, OK. <laughs> I will. <laughs> but yeah, that, that sounds very much what I would need. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not a module system. It's not a fixed point. It's a separate thing. And yes. it's not like a graph, I think. So yeah, that's just the remark I wanted to make. OK. Did you manage to actually run it on non Nix OS? You know what? I didn't try. <laughs> no. That's an interesting problem. Yes, we for sure. We can run Nix on. Oh, you mean Nix on itself on non Nix OS? Nix with Nix services on non Nix OS. Oh, okay. Like Next Cloud from Nix OS on Ubuntu or whatever. Okay. No, I no definitely not. I didn't try that. It's easy to run it on Mac OS than on Linux. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, it's definitely something that I would consider using. Uh, the example you gave, you went from your big mess into this beautiful Nextcloud one-liner. Uh, when you see this all finished, there wouldn't be a Nextcloud one-liner anymore. Do you have any ideas about how you could implement defaults, or is that something that's come into your thinking um, so that a newcomer to Nix can really easily still use Nextcloud without knowing all these dependencies? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it would look like, but I, I don't see an issue having defaults, or I don't see, I mean, a technical issue of writing defaults, uh, be it in this way. Maybe, like you know, you have this adapter kind of stuff. Maybe, you, maybe we will settle on having a, a layer on top. You know, that would be this contract world on top of uh, things that exist. Um, no, no, I think about it. Maybe it's not a good idea because of the inversion of dependency. But yes, I don't see why we couldn't have defaults, even if it's like. Um, you know, parked somewhere inside Nix packages, uh, a default thing that sets up a lot of contracts by itself. Um, that could work too. But yes, for sure, you're, you're, we're getting further from the one-liner. That's for, that's for true. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker again.